Thanks, brother. Well, good morning. Hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is beautiful out there, isn't it? I have to uh, introduce somebody to you. Uh, I want to introduce to you Brad and Jamie Suizo, who was just married yesterday. Come on. Go. Married yesterday and here today. Absolutely amazing. I, I just, I commend you guys for that. That is really cool. I, I don't know if I could have done that. <laughs> no, it's exciting. What an exciting time. You remember, those of you who are married, you remember when you were married? It's okay, right? <laughs> it's still okay, right? <laughs> Good. Good. Well, we're currently uh, in the book of Ephesians. We have been for since I've been here. <laughs> but we're in chapter 6. So if you, wanna, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, we're currently examining the Christian's battle against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the scripture says, against the, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is, not a, this is not a flesh and blood battle, is it? Although, Satan does use people, unregenerate people, his people, to accomplish his purposes. And so we need to realize that. But we've, I've said this before, I'll say it again, that there is no human being that has ever lived, that lives today or ever will live, that is any match for this wicked, evil, scheming, powerful foe. Well, with the exception of one human, long ago, who lived, came to this earth, and that was the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and praise God that he has come and defeated this great foe. But in and of our strength, the human beings are, are no match for this, for this being, this wicked person. It's the old hymn. Remember that old hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God by, by Luther? He makes a statement in there. He says, on earth is not his equal, speaking of the enemy. No one can stand against him. So we need, to, we need something. What do we need? We need Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the armor of God and to understand how this works in the believer's life as we engage in spiritual warfare. So how do we stand against the Lord? Paul answers that in verse 10. In fact, I'm going to read several verses here again, and I'll read them over and over again. I hope you do too, because it's so important we get this. It says, he says, finally, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as the shoes for your feet, having put on with readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying at all times in the Spirit. And I'll stop right there. This, this is, I mean, all scripture, folks, is absolutely vitally important. But this is important here. I mean, really, really important in that all of us, all of us are engaged as believers. If you're a believer in Christ, this is a battle. And it's a daily battle. 
And the sooner we realize that we're engaged in this kind of a war, the, the more we're going to realize how much we need our Lord Jesus Christ every single day. Not just Sundays, not just in the morning, but I need Him all day. I need Him all night to guard my thoughts and minds. I think the enemy can even attack us in dreams. And so when I go to bed at night, I often say, Lord, would you protect my mind as I sleep? Have you ever woke up and you had this weird dream? You go, man, that was wicked. Where did that come from? Maybe I'm just the only one. I, uh, but we do. We all struggle. Are you driving down the road and a thought comes to your mind? You're going, you know, where did that come from? And, and as believers, we need to learn how to use the armor of God. We need to learn how to take, take thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus Christ. We don't have to let that thought permeate it in our, in our minds and hearts. And, you know, because really, what you think and what you dwell on, you will become. It's really true. And so we're learning. How do we stand against the enemy? Well, Paul says in verse 10, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. How do we do that? He says, put on the whole armor of God. How do we do that? And that's what we're considering. How do we do this? How do we do this? Folks, this is, this is our only hope. This is... The only solution, our only resource against the attacks of the enemy. Anybody go through a battle this week? You know, and, and there's many manifestations of the devil's work. You know, he, he's constantly bombarding us with frustrations and, and confusion and discouragement, fear, worry, anger, uncertainty, you know, hopelessness. And the list goes on and on and on. And these things can become bondages. Neil Anderson wrote a really good book. It's called The Bondage Breaker. And he wrote a follow-up on that, I think. It was called Victory in Christ or something like that. But excellent book. But he, the main thesis of the book is that, believer, do you know who you are in Christ? And do you know what you have in Christ? Because, folks, honestly, most believers don't know. And, and that's sad, because that's right where the enemy wants us, isn't it? The enemy loves to rob us as Christians, rob us of our, of our joy, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, our peace, our kindness, you know. Have you ever, have you ever lost the joy of the Lord? You know, I look at that passage in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Where it says, Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I've always pondered that. You know, what is that? How is the joy of the Lord my strength? And as I think that through, it's pretty obvious. Where does the joy of the Lord come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the first facet of love in the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, singular. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then he, I believe he's going on to show them the beauty of that love. And the first thing is joy. And when, when joy is filling your heart, the joy of God, the joy of the Spirit, that's not based on circumstances, God's in control of your life. And that's why the joy of the Lord is our strength. God's in control. And that's what we want, folks. <laughs> we want Him to be in control. Because what I'm in control... Uh oh, you know, bad things can happen, and they, and, they, and they usually do. And there's different phrases that Jesus used that I think it's, that also are, 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 are a similarity to the same thing we're talking about here when we talk about the joy of the Lord, the, the, the armor of God, uh, you know, putting on Christ, being filled with the Spirit. John 14, 20, Jesus said, you and me and I and you. Have you ever thought that through? You and me. The believers in Christ, and Jesus said, I in you. Christ is in us. Awesome. Doesn't get any better than that. And then he said in John 15, 4, he said, Abide in me. Abide in me. This is, this is the issue of fellowship. 
Walking with God. Walking in obedience. Walking with the armor of God on you. And so we see this in the Word of God. But in Ephesians 6, Paul, he breaks it down for us, I believe. He breaks it down. Folks, we have, as believers, we have been set free. We have been set free from the bondage of sin, haven't we? Sin no longer has a grip on us. Sin no longer is our master. But we have been set free and now we have a new master. The master Jesus Christ, the, the master of righteousness, the master of the Holy Spirit that's living in us and guiding us. And so we need to realize that, you know, we don't have to be in bondages. And yet, in saying that, so many believers today are in bondage. And the enemy wants you to think, I can't do anything about it. You can't, but God can. Bondage to a thought life, bondage to, to, to temper, bondage to pornography, bondage, and it goes on and on and on. We're set free from that as believers in Jesus Christ. Our God is the bondage breaker. Let's not succumb to the enemy's schemes. Let's not do that. Let's be aware. Let's be ready. Let's be prepared. We want to walk in victory. Amen? Victory. Now, the first piece of armor that, that we've, we've looked at is, is the belt of truth. And, I, you know, I'm going to be iterating these in each message because I, I don't think, uh, we can't say enough on these. The belt of truth. And, and I've suggested to you that the first three pieces of armor are, are permanent. They're, they're positional. The moment you came to faith in Jesus Christ, this happened to you. And so you, as a believer, a believing sinner, when you came to Christ, you saw Jesus as the truth, the embodiment of truth. You believed that what he said was true. You believe the gospel is true. Everything hinges on truth. And folks, the enemy is attacking truth today. And I'll talk more about that later on, hopefully. So the belt of truth is, is fastened on. We walk, we walk in truth. Jesus is the truth. Secondly, we saw that believers, when they come to Christ, they understand that Jesus is the truth. They, are, they put their faith in Him and they receive something. What? They receive a righteousness that is not their own. But it's the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. The very righteousness of Christ. You know, so often we get this one confused too, folks. Christians live in a bondage of performance. We do. I got to perform for God today. You know, in order to be accepted by Him. And if I don't do enough, oh man, He's not going to accept me. That is a, if you're a believer, that is a lie of the devil. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to understand that you have fully, completely been accepted by God the Father. Why? Because it's not your merit. It's Jesus, man. <laughs> he, it's all of His merit that He worked out for you in life. Folks, He did it right. The first Adam blew it. The second one, Jesus, He did it right. And so when you put faith in Christ... You recognize He's the truth. You receive a righteousness that is forever. Nobody will ever take that from you if you're a true Christian. And so you walk in that righteousness. You wake up every day realizing that everything you face today, every temptation to bombard you today, bombard you, today you stand in the righteousness of Jesus. You don't stand in your own merit. But that doesn't take... We've got to be careful with this one, though. Because sometimes we can think, okay, I'm there, I've arrived, I've got the righteousness of Christ, it's not going to get any better, it's perfect, so I can just kind of do what I want to do. Mm -mm. 
You know, 1 John has a lot to say about that. And so we recognize that if we're truly saved and have received the righteousness of Jesus because we know He's true, then there's going to be some evidences in our life that validate that fact. We're going to walk with God. We're going to desire obedience. But there's a different kind of obedience now as a believer. It's not an obedience to the legality of the law any longer. It's, an it's a gracious obedience. I love that. I love that word grace, don't you? You see, gracious obedience has a lot of imperfections. But all those imperfections are covered by the blood of Jesus. And so I can continuously walk in fellowship with God. When I blow it, I recognize that there's an issue with intimacy now with God. My prayer life is affected. My studying the Word is affected. My living out obedience is affected. But I can get right with Him in a moment and say, Lord, I recognize that this was, this was wrong. This was sin. Lord, would you just cleanse that from me? I, I want to stay free from that, Lord. And man, He cleanses you and you're right back in that intimate fellowship with Him. It's an amazing thing, the Christian life. Is it not? It, it really is. We stand as believers in Christ in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And folks, I really believe that the armor of God is the antidote to feeling, feelings of unworthiness and feelings of failure. Have you ever felt like that? Feelings of discouragement. We all battle stuff like this. It's life, right? None of us are exempt from these kinds of things. But when we recognize more and more, and I think this is sanctification, we're growing, as we recognize more and more who we are in Christ, oh man, the more joy comes to us, floods our souls. It's so amazing, isn't it? I was thinking about this the other day about the gospel. And one time somebody came to me and it's happened more than once, but they said, Pastor, could you get beyond the gospel, man? It's kind of, the, it's the milk. Ooh, don't ever say that to me. <laughs> the gospel is the milk? Yeah, you know, it's for the baby Christians. It is? Yeah. Then you don't know the gospel, man. The gospel is simple enough that a little child can believe. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. A little child can be illuminated by the Spirit and believe in Jesus and be saved. And yet the greatest minds of our day, the greatest minds that have ever lived, have never ever been able to plumb the depths of the gospel. God is the gospel. God is, is, is the good news. And we need to recognize that. It's like, I, I think of it like this. The gospel is like, it's kind of like a, uh, an iceberg in an ocean that has no bottom. <laughs> and the iceberg has no bottom. It just keeps on going and it keeps on getting wider and wider and wider. But just the tip of the iceberg is showing above the water. Folks, we're on the tip of the iceberg. And we've got the, the depths of the gospel to plumb all through eternity. The gospel is amazing. It's so profound. It's so deep. It's so amazing. And so, folks, we've got to realize these things, these basic fundamentals of our faith. We as Christians, we've come to that place that we know Christ is the truth. We've placed in Christ, in the truth. we received the righteousness of God. And we, we recognize that these are our weapons of warfare. We recognize that the enemy has been defeated. You know what I read last Sunday? I read a verse in Colossians that you should memorize. It's an awesome verse. Because God tells us through Paul in that, that verse that he has disarmed the enemy. You know, really, when it comes right down to it, Satan only has one weapon. And guess what it is? It's the law of God. He uses the law of God against us. We have all broken God's law, right? And the accuser of the saints comes before God and he says, Hey, hey look at Tim down there. He blew this one. And he blew that one. 
and, and I do break the law, and so do you. We don't want to. Hopefully we're not intentionally doing that. That's a whole other issue, if we are. But we have a, a defender, a great advocate. And who's that? It's Jesus. And he stands before the Father and he says, Yeah, yeah, he has broken the law, Father, but I fulfilled it for him. Listen to what Colossians says. I'll read it again. He, he talks about how God in Christ has canceled the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands. That's the law. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them in Christ through the cross. And that is so, so good, folks. That is the best news we could ever hear. The law of God has been set aside. It's, it never accuses us any longer as believers because someone fulfilled it for us. Now, that doesn't mean that we discard the law of God. Of course it doesn't. The Bible says the law is righteous, holy, and good. And of course we want to obey God. But we recognize we can't do it perfectly, but we can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit in our day. I can love my enemies. <laughs> I can. I can't, but the Lord can give me that power to do it. I can be obedient to God, but it's based on, it's based on the work and power of God in my life. Now the third piece. Boy, we finally got to that. <sighs> The, first, the third piece, as shoes fitted, as shoes for your feet, having put on with readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, I call these the gospel shoes because that's what Paul's using. Now, remember, he's, this, this is an analogy. He's, he's probably looking at a Roman soldier, and the Holy Spirit is illuminating Paul as he's writing these things down, and he's depicting all these pieces of armor and how it relates to us as believers, as being the armor of God. Now think about shoes. <laughs> we don't think about it much in our culture because everybody usually wears them, right? Usually. Maybe there's a few oddballs out there that don't wear shoes, and I think there are, but most people. So, but shoes are essential for battle. Imagine a Roman soldier going out to battle, and he's got all his armor on from head all the way down, except no shoes. How long would this individual last in battle? Not very long. He'd be, he'd be defeated rather quickly. Rather quickly. You see, the Romans, they came up with some very effective footwear. They had these, these shoes that were, that were made of real strong, tough leather. And on the bottom, there was a metal plate that would protect them from these traps that would be set. In those days, they didn't have mines. But what they'd do is they'd put these spikes into the ground and just have them stick it above the ground so soldiers would come and they'd run and they'd wound their feet. And if a soldier wounded his feet, he would be worthless in battle. But the Romans took care of that problem. And they came up with this, this footwear that really was effective in the midst of warfare. History tells us that wars were, were won or lost based on the footwear of the army. Very interesting. And so Paul says, put on these, these shoes. Put on with readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now what is that? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> the gospel of peace. The now, now think about how these all flow with us. Okay, you got truth, you got righteousness, and now we've got peace. There's different takes on this, folks, uh, and I recognize that. What is the gospel of peace? Well, I believe, first of all, it's what we've been talking about, our position in Christ. Romans 5.1. Being justified by faith, we now have peace with God. Aren't you? Doesn't that just bless the socks off? You think about this. Before you came to Christ, before you were given this peace, whether you recognized it or not, 
you were at war with God. Folks, that's not a good thing. It is not a good thing to be at war with God. Every human being on this planet without Christ right now, whether they recognize it or not, they are at war with God. And that war will one day come to fruition. And you don't want to be on the side of the goats. It's a bad thing. That's why we as believers need to be taking the gospel out. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the gospel is the gospel of peace. It, it's, what brings, it's what brings peace between God and man. The peace of God. There's that picture in the Old Testament where God is depicted as a, as a warrior, a mighty warrior, and his sword is drawn out of his sheath, and he's ready for battle. He's ready to slay the wicked. But folks, for the believer in Christ, this great warrior, God, has put the sword back in his sheath. There's now peace between you and God. God will never come to you and judge you and annihilate you and destroy you. Why? Because Jesus Christ is your peace. You have been justified by faith. You have been declared righteous before the God of the universe, the judge of the universe. And folks, that is good news. It will never leave you. you. You are secure in your peace with God. But Satan comes along and says, hey, you know, hey, you know, God is really, really mad at you. God is just you, you know, and and and, and, and it causes you to live in defeat. And, you know, with fear and anxiety and discouragement. Folks, it's not true. You, the peace of God positionally will never leave you because it's not based on you. It's based on Christ. It's all based on Him. <laughs> and what a beautiful thing that is. So, it's our position, peace with God that we receive at the moment of salvation. The second thing is, I believe, this, this, the gospel shoes of of peace uh, have referred to the, the believers being ready and prepared to defend the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, folks, there is a, a battle going on for the truth of the gospel. And you've heard me talk about that. Uh, that there, uh, Scripture teaches us that. There has been a battle since the beginning with this issue of truth. In Paul's day, the New Testament era, there was a battle going on. That's why Jude writes in Jude 3, he says that we are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend for the faith. And so we need to be involved in understanding that, that we are standing for truth, that we, that we want nothing but the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's the only power unto salvation. Now think about a real war. What's, what's the strategy of the opponent? The strategy is take out the power source. Find that place where all the nukes are and wipe them out. And then you got them. And doesn't that kind of fit? I mean, when you think of the spiritual warfare, what's Satan's strategy? Take out the gospel. And you know he can't, but he can, he can mess it up. He can bring about a different gospel for people to believe. He can confuse people as to what the truth really is. And so he's very, very effective, it seems, in doing that. Folks, the New Testament is so serious about this issue. This is why I, you know, I, I constantly, Lord, let me be right in this. Don't let me miss this, God. I want to be right. Let me understand what your word says about salvation. And, and I, I, there's, a sense of, there's a sense of the fear of the Lord in this, in this uh, uh, kind of a healthy fear that causes me like, man, I'm walking on sacred ground here. 
But folks, we need as believers to know that this is the most serious thing to God. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, you know, Paul is, Paul's writing to, a, uh, to the Galatian church. And, because there were some believers in Galatia who were saying, yeah, salvation by faith plus the right of circumcision. And you, know, you talk about angry. I think Paul's just throffing at the mouth here. He's, he's really upset so much so that, that he says this. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, he says, If we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And then the next statement, you know what he does? He repeats it. And whenever you see something repeated in Scripture, I mean, Scripture is serious and important just at face value. But when you see something repeated, whoa, God is, God is serious here. And so Paul recognizes that. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy was, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, he said listen, he says, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, that's us, that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. <laughs> what? Folks, any false gospel, any false gospel is deceitful. It's the teaching of demons. And we need to recognize that. Oh, it might come across all colorly and flowerly, you know, all these, you know, all these things, good feelings, stuff. But Satan's all about that. He masquerades as an angel of light. He's not going to show his true colors. Uh, he will sometime, but the, I think his main method is he's, he's masquerading. And so we need to know as believers what is, what is the true gospel. I mean, think about it. I wrote down a few attacks here in our day. The gospel is under attack from the radical non-lordship salvation heresy people. Now, if you remember back in the 80s, there was this kind of book war going on over the issue of lordship salvation. And John MacArthur, bless his heart, he wrote a book called The Gospel According to Jesus. And in it, he shows that, you know, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but, he's, but he kind of goes through his book and shows that if, if salvation is truly there, then that faith will, it'll never be alone in the sense that there will be evidences in one's life. And then Zane Hodges from Dallas Theological Seminary said, no way, man, that's wrong. He basically wrote a book, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a counter to that. And, and he wrote it, says, no, if you, if you add all those things like salvation and, and works and repentance, all those things, all those things are, are works. And, and I said, no. And MacArthur in his book, he, he rightly points out that Jesus warned of many who would claim to believe in him, but they were genuinely not saved. Sobering. Matthew 7, 21, read it. And you look at, at the book of, of James and John. You know, they're writing here showing that, hey, this is what true believing grace looks like. If you placed faith in Christ and received the grace of salvation, then this is what it's going to look like. You're going to have a heart for God. You're going to live out gracious obedience. Not legal, but gracious we're going to get into that when we start the, the book of 1 John. We're going to do that, I think, Lord willing. We'll see how it goes. But you know, it's really interesting. I've always found this interesting, that there's this big dilemma between Paul and James. Like Paul wrote, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and he did. And James says, no, nah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's works too. And it's a whole different way of looking at it. One is what man sees, and the other is what God sees. James is what man sees. Paul is what God sees. It's a different perspective. But in reality, folks, Paul was saying the same thing that James was saying. And I'll prove it to you. You've got to have your Bible to see this. Look at Acts 26 real quick. Chapter 26. And I'm going to read verse 18 and uh, following. I can find it here. Huh. 
Somebody cut the book of Acts out of my Bible. You ever have that problem? You go, man, no, it's there. You know, it's right here. Okay. Acts 26, verse 18. Now, Paul is before King Agrippa. He's given a defense. And, uh, you know, I, I love how Paul does this. In verse 18, now he's, he's, he's explaining how, he was, how God had called him. And he says, God had called me to open the, their eyes, the eyes of the Gentiles, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are, are sanctified by faith in me. This is... In verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, Paul says... I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that, now watch this, that they should turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Paul right there is saying, this was my message. That if you're truly saved, deeds will follow. The same thing that James says. There's no discrepancy there, folks. Of course salvation is by grace alone. Of course it's through faith alone. In Christ alone. But true biblical salvation will never be alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We love that verse, don't we? We looked at it. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. But we forget verse 10. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The both are together there. And so we need to recognize this. You know, you, you don't separate... Lordship and grace. Lordship and justification. Jesus is Lord. And for someone to say, you know, I'm going to come to Jesus Christ and re receive salvation, but I'm not going to bow. <laughs> I'm not going to submit. Wrong. Wrong. You must come with a heart that says, Jesus is Lord. My faith is in Him. Then there was another controversy, and it's kind of happening today. It's the gospel's under attack through the seeker-sensitive seeker church movement. Some might not like this, but I, I'm, I'm anti-seeker-sensitive church movement. I really am, and I think you know that. But what, it, what happens with his movement is it has softened the offense of the gospel to make the gospel more palatable and user-friendly. The seeker uh, movement has applied a, a number of marketing principles to, to the church so that they can create this kind of church growth. They did a survey one time amongst a number of unbelievers, and they asked the questions, a question, what would it take to get you to come to church? And they got all kinds of answers. They, they called them the customers. <laughs> oh, man. One was this, oh, we would like it if he had the service more upbeat that relates to our felt needs. Tell us how we can be successful at work. Tell us how our marriage can work. Tell us how we can cope with our problems. Now, that, listen, that's not to say that the, the gospel it, it has the answer to these issues. But this isn't the basis on why we go to church. The overall basis some have said, well, you know, uh, give us contemporary music and make us, make us feel good, you know. Stop preaching at us with this, these hellfire messages. You know, entertain us. Entertain us like the movie theaters do and the plays and the, all these dramas. Be like that. It's this give me, give me, give me. And it feeds right into this consumer mindset that people come to church with this idea, what am I going to get? Wrong. It's what are you going to give?
You know, the, the gospel in this, in this movement is, is changing to some variation of, of, of this kind of thing. Like, give Jesus a try and, and he'll help you with your problems. Give Jesus a try? Give me a break, man. That's not the gospel. This is another form of idolatry where you use the Jesus idol to get what you want. And we should be so careful that we don't fall into that trap. In fact, you know, I was thinking about this too. I want you to turn over to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, and, and see if this sounds familiar. Maybe I've taken you to this place before. This is God speaking. Isaiah 30, verse 9. Uh, this is what God is saying that the people of Israel are saying, his people. Verse 9 says, For they, God says, For they are a rebellious people, a lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to their seers, Do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the, the way and, and turn aside from the path. Let us, let us hear no more about this Holy One of Israel. Things haven't changed. Satan's methods are, are still being regurgitated in every generation it just comes at us in different directions and different ways. The, the, the third issue that, that I wrote down here is that the gospel is under attack from the postmodern views of the emerging church movement. The emerging church movement is basically saying that truth is relative. And it ultimately says that you can't know anything a certain way for sure. There is no certainty. There, the absolutes have kind of gone out the window. Everything's kind of, you know, up for grabs. There's an attack on the atonement of Christ in this movement by embracing a tolerant, in, inclusive universalism that embraces everyone. Everybody makes it, man. You know? What does it do? It does not confront the believing sinner with their sin and their need for repentance and their need to get right with God and He's the only one that can make it right. Univer 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 universe. Say it for me. Universalism. Man, I tell you, my tongue can get really in knots up here. I, you, you people make me nervous sometimes, you know that? <laughs> and there are many other attacks that I don't have time to get into now, but th th there's, this, there's this new perspective on Paul now in the, that's kind of sweeping the churches that undermines justification by faith, which is the very heart of the gospel, right? Then there's this open theism that attacks the sovereignty and omniscience of God. Then there's this issue of the, of the false gospel that promotes health and wealth. It promises health and wealth to everybody. And then there's this name it, claim it movement that kind of manipulates God that says, God do this, God do that, God do, you know? There's all these things that are, what is Satan doing, folks? He's attacking the truth of the gospel because if he gets us off there, guess what? People don't get saved. Because Paul says, right? Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Folks, the gospel is the only power of God to save people. It's the only thing. And oh, it's a beautiful thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the gospel shoes, there's one more thing, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I've already alluded to it several times, but the, I think the gospel shoes represent being prepared and ready to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the highway and byways. To go out of the, the walls of this church, to go out and share with people, tell people the truth of the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. Be ready. But in order to be ready, in order to be prepared, what do you need? You need to know the truth. You need to know the gospel. Folks, God is the gospel. He created a world, and this world fell into sin. But the Bible says that God in his love and in his justice, he sent his son. The incarnation. God became a man. And he lived among us. And he lived a life that no man can live. He did it right. He fulfilled all righteousness. And the heart of the gospel is that this great God-man, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he, he went to the cross and he paid your debt. He paid my debt so that, so that I can know him and love him and have everlasting life. He did it and he proved that everything that he said, everything he did was absolutely valid because when they put him in the grave, man, they could not keep him there. He walked away. He rose again from the dead. And he appeared to over 500 people. And then he ascended back to his rightful place. And he stands before the Father, even at this very moment. And he intercedes for you. He tells the Father constantly, I loved him. I, I, I gave my life for him. Folks, that's the gospel that this world needs to hear. I don't want anybody going to hell. Do you? <laughs> Hope not. Some of them have said the difference between heaven and hell is really about 16 inches. A distance between your head and your heart. You can have a lot of head knowledge. Pharisees did. But they didn't take any of it to heart. Well, Paul did, praise God. Folks, we have, got a, we have got a mission. This church, Good News Fellowship. Good News. We're about the gospel here. Let's, let's share it with somebody this week. Think of somebody, your neighbor, your co-worker. Somebody. Think of somebody that you can say, Hey, you know, man, uh, let me tell you something. And you can tell him the story, but give him the bad news before you give him the good news. Because if you tell somebody that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, they're going to go, oh, that's nice and warm and fuzzy. And he came to, to, to save you. Save me from what? Nobody knows they're going to need a Savior until they recognize they need saving. Right? So give them the gospel, the true gospel. Let's pray together. Father God, you are so good to us. You have done everything for us. And we praise you as our Lord and God and Master and King today. Father, we thank you so much for what you have given to us that's available for us to walk this life in victory. You've given us the belt of truth. You've given us the breastplate of righteousness. You've given us, God, the gospel shoes of peace. That there is a way to be at peace with you, but it's only through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.